You have to keep dancing, Pierre. I do? No. Yes. Nobody wants to see the white man tornado. <laughs> All right. So the music has stopped. It was a pretty good tune. How are you doing, April? It was, it was good. Hey, Pierre, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Oh, welcome to the 2021 edition of the Automation and DevOps Summit. Uh, my name is Pierre Roman. I'm a senior cloud advocate for Microsoft. Uh, what that means is that my job or our jobs, because uh, April will introduce herself in a second, is to tell you guys about the products that we have, how we think they can impact your uh, environment but also to listen to what you guys have to say about it, whether or not these work in your scenarios, and then tell us so that we can uh, translate those requirements for our engineering team. Uh, I've been in the business for, and I'm gonna age myself severely here, uh, for about 30 years. Uh, so I have seen evolution of automation and uh, some DevOps, and it's changed a lot, uh, but there's always more to learn. So. Uh, with me today, I have the April Edwards. How are you doing, April? Hey, Pierre. Welcome, everyone. So introduce so, uh, yourself. Please. I want to welcome everyone to the DevOps and Automation Summit. So like Pierre's mentioned, I'm April Edwards. I'm also a senior cloud advocate here at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for about four years, and I've been in the industry for over 20 years. I actually started my tech career in Louisville, Kentucky. If anyone out there is hailing from Louisville or Kentucky, um, I am also the DevOps practice lead for the advocacy team. So I kind of own the remit for the DevOps lab, devblogs.microsoft.com, and kind of the whole automation DevOps piece that we go to share with you guys as the community, um, along with some of the products that go along with it as well. Uh, I have an ops background. I moved into development. So I have that really good DevOps flavor from both sides of the fence. Yep. So Pierre, I think you're going to kick us off. I am, I am. But before we do, uh, I have a note from our sponsors. Uh, no, um, James has uh, asked me to tell you all to check the uh, agenda. Uh, apparently, there has been some last minute changes, and uh, we don't want you to make it to uh, miss anything. So make sure that you check the uh, online agenda and make sure that it's in line with what you have in your own schedule. That being said, um, I was very much looking forward to meet you all face to face in Nashville, uh, especially since this morning I woke up to six inches of snow on my front yard. Um, it's just like a hello, Pierre. Winter is here. Now you're going to be stuck in your house for the next six months. But uh, in this age of the human malware, we have to make do with a virtual event. So let's go. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been in uh, uh, operations for a long time. So when April and I started thinking about what we or how we were going to structure this uh, session, I figured uh, let's do DevOps for ops sakes, because we always talk about DevOps in or very often uh, talk about DevOps in the optics of supporting a dev team. But I know from experience, having been in the crop corporate world, managing data centers, managing corporate environment, that not all DevOps and not all automation is leading into a to supporting a dev team that pulls out uh, regular applications. Sometimes it's just DevOps and automation just to make sure that the lights stay on for your internal line of business applications, for your network as a whole, for all of your different parts of your environment that you're looking at um, setting up. So that being said, uh, let's move on. But before we go, uh, I wanted to take a moment because April and I have something very personal to us that's happened not too long ago. Uh, because this year has been really hard for a lot of us, uh, the isolation, the stress of the pandemic. And some of us, because of the pandemic or other reasons, uh, I've lost somebody that were dear to us. This community specifically, in my opinion, has lost one of its best. 
um, a wonderful human being, a true rock star in every sense of the word. Uh, and of course, an amazing uh, DevOps engineer. So I thought it'd be appropriate for us to uh, take a minute and remember and honor uh, Abel Wang. Oh, sorry, I always get a little. <laughs> it's dusty in here. My eyeballs are sweating. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Is that what it, is that what's happening? Okay, I thought yes. it was just. Oh wait, I thought I had like a little dust in my eye. All right. So when we're looking at DevOps and automation, especially what we've been doing for the last little while, um, I'm getting calls from people, and I, I tried to keep in touch with some of the people in the in the community, and they're keep, they keep asking me. So, what have you been up to for the last year? And I always reply, like, this is it. This is what all of us uh, have been doing, toiling and working from home, uh, making sure environments are up, running, healthy, uh, and all of that at a distance. Uh, we are ensuring that our dev teams have um, something to deploy to. We're ensuring that the people that are working remotely can connect. So we're managing all of this information, uh, all of this infrastructure and all of this, these services. And we're doing this remotely uh, and for most cases without severe issues. And this has been our lot. This is what we have been um, stuck with for the past two years. Has it already been two years? Man. <sighs> two years, two years. This all kicked off two years ago. Yeah, it, it's it's annoying. But as Mr. Snover once said, uh, in a lousy economy, or in this case, in a lousy uh, time, uh, nothing is more important than automation. Productivity equals career security. I'm not sure if I completely agree with that statement, that last productivity equals security. Uh, but I've learned uh, in the past not to argue with Jeffrey Snover because he knows everything. Uh, and he's a wonderful human being. But I truly believe that the age of the human malware has highlighted some very important stuff that we do, that our work does. How to use proper automation and proper uh, uh, other DevOps practices have benefited the enterprises that we support. So whether it's enterprise or a dev team, of course, uh, those practices have benefited the environment because we've been able to uh, do these at a uh, at uh, um, remotely. And let's be clear: whether you support a dev team or not, practices like Incremental release and, and continuous integration are key. You your, your project, divide it in small, manageable chunk. You make little changes at a time. So if something goes wrong, like for us this morning, like updates and, and, and some issues with cameras and microphones for small changes, or uh, April that uh, decided to make a network change this weekend and couldn't get to the internet before this session, little panic sets in, but because it's a small, small change, easy to fix. So practices like that, like incremental changes, like um, automation and pipelines, and that can, be, that can mean many things to many audiences. So for developers uh, among you, uh, I'm not a developer. Uh, April is more of a developer than, than I can ever hope to get to be. Uh, it can be automating your uh, unit testing for your code to make sure it's ready before it's actually deployed. It can mean uh, automated builds, automated deployment into dev and tests and slots, but I'm not teaching you anything new. If you're in this uh, conference, this is something you live and breathe. But for IT pro and operations folks, those same practices can be applied, but it can mean uh, using the built-in tools to apply, for example, governance policies like where your uh, policy, your uh, resources are allowed to be deployed, uh, how they can be managed and and stay compliant. Uh, it can mean using code 
to deploy certain environments and testing, um, infrastructure as code, uh, automation routine, run books. Uh, there's a number of ways that we can use uh, small pieces of code or, or in some cases, large pieces of code to automate our environment, even with a, when we're not supporting a dev team. Each of our environments and situations are unique. So there's really no cookie cutter approach to this. So we really need to uh, continue doing it. Uh, one of the most important thing that's happening uh, that we need to make sure that it continues to happen is continuous monitoring. So we have to set up mechanisms to monitor and collect those logs, analyze them. And I'm telling you, like I said earlier, I've been here in, here in this building business for 30 years. One of my first jobs was to come in on Monday morning because I was the FNG, the 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 new guy. Uh, and my job on Monday morning was to log into every server and look at all the logs and look for errors. I'm telling you, after you've looked at about a couple hundred lines of logs, your brain's not processing it anymore. And that's why uh, automation is so important because that's what it's built for. It's built to collect and analyze and react to changes in your environment and to issues in your environment. And if a way, if problem is detected, you can quickly revert the previous code, you can revert to a previous state, or you can roll back the change that you've done uh, and not affect everyone. So that being said, we still need to include people and processes because of course it's people, processes, and, and uh, product. Uh, but we have to start early in the uh, planning se segment. For the developers, I'd like to ask you to involve your, your IT team to ensure your smooth operation, to make sure that uh, there's no afterthoughts, to make sure that it's sized properly, but also to make sure that uh, if when you talk to your IT and security teams that your traffic that you're expecting to go is going not going to be blocked. It's not going to be uh, uh, throttled. That the data that you store is going to be secure and also compliant because in corporate environments, it's not just about what you store, but it's how you store it. And especially with if you're in Europe, because I've we're looking at this, the, the chat earlier and there's some people from uh, all over the place from Europe. I saw one from Africa and a lot of you from uh, uh, southern U.S., which right now, considering the six inch of snow, I am very jealous of you guys. Uh, you're having some uh, okay weather versus us. But you have to really talk to your environment. You have to reply, uh, uh, involve all of those teams. And IT folks that, and operations folks that are in uh, listening right now, talk to your dev. Figure out what infrastructures they're going to need to ensure their apps are affected. If you're about to make a policy change on your environment, uh, make sure that they are involved so that they don't end up um, with their apps not working. Talk to them, find out what performance metric their application specifically uh, should be monitored to ensure that their app or, or their line of business or whatever they're deploying uh, is working as planned. There's many more situation and practices that we can talk about, but I, I wanna move on. And I've always said that uh, DevOps is not something that you should sell in a box. Uh, it's not a SKU. Well, actually, I said that before Microsoft came up and renamed our products Azure DevOps. Um, I've had a chat with the marketing people. I'm not sure where they came up with this, but DevOps is a series, as you know, <laughs> it is a series of practices. It's, it's, a, it's a journey. It's not something that you buy in a box and deploy. Uh, however, that family of products under Azure DevOps is a set of tools and products that will help you address those. So whether it's Azure DevOps umbrella uh, product family or the GitHub, uh, there are many ways for us to help you impl implement those practices. And actually April will, will rock, walk you through uh, a lot of those in the second part of this um, session. I'm just looking to see if there are any Questions in the chat? No. All right. Uh, but when we talk about DevOps uh, or automation, speaking from the operations side of things and looking at operations, we know that uh, 
there are different philosophies regarding automation, especially in a corporate environment. And I wanted to, in the first uh, half of this, kind of review a little bit of those philosophies and how they apply to our environment. So there are areas of uh, discussions. And one that I've had actually with uh, people at Pluralsight, uh, I've had a chat with them lately and they've even had a nice little webcast where like pros versus cons. Do we automate all the things or do we automate all, all, some of the things? And don't get me wrong. I truly believe that automation is required in this day and age complete, uh, when you consider the complexity of the environments that we build that we build and maintain. So should we automate everything? Maybe, maybe not. There's lots of factors to be uh, considered. Is it a recurring task? Is there a clear trigger or is it ad hoc? So is it somebody that shows up at your desk and says, hey, I need this to happen. And then you do it. Is there a native programmatic way of executing that task? Or do you have to glue together with bubble gum and duct tape uh, multiple different things to make it happen? Is that what's the level of complexity? Is the task a dependency in a greater process? These are all things that we need to really understand before we decide what we automate and what we do not automate. Uh, one of the things is, will this be executed by multiple people or multiple departments? Because I know for a fact, if you give uh, an operations person a build document to say, go build me this server, because I'm going to host this service on it. If you give that same document to five people, you're going to end up with five slightly different servers. So automating that process, uh, it, it ensures uh, compliance to your build document. What if you get hit by a bus? If, uh, sorry, I don't mean to uh, wish harm on anyone, but as a corporate entity or an enterprise, you're looking at that. And if you have a very complex automation routines, will the next person taking over you, will they be able to support it? Or is this something that only knew you know? So, and of course, does it comply with your compliance requirements, such as how you're storing stuff or where you're storing stuff and how secure does it need to be and, and so on. So the next point, corporate knowledge and standards. It actually kind of ties into the first one a little bit, but is your, uh, is your uh, automation well documented? Can somebody else pick it up and move on with it? Can auditors look at your script or your documentation and see that it follows the process that needs to uh, occur uh, for compliance? Is it up to date? Do you have it in a central repo or do you have it in a, a folder on your desktop? And if so, does everybody else on your team have a slightly different version of it on their desktop? These are all things that in a corporate environment, when we're looking at automation, you need to look after. And it's so like automation versus documentation. Which part do you decide not to automate, but to clearly document the process so that somebody, anybody can grab it and go. And of course, if we can update it or not update it, but if we can uh, automate it properly, then I have no problem with automating all of the things. One of the, uh, one of the last few things, uh, return on investment. If you're going to spend 40, 50, 60 hours writing your process and your automated routines using multiple tools and triggers and monitoring process, for something that changes regularly, is that something that needs to be addressed? Obviously, yes. But how do you address it? How do you... Um, tackle that automation routine. These are all things that we need to be very aware of that. And the last thing is decision gates and human intervention. In my years in operations, I have seen too many botched automation processes where no decision gate or human intervention or really critical systems 
led to entire environments going down for long periods, much longer than the SLA allowed for. So if you have a really complex poor process, do you have some type of decision gate? Do you have some point uh, human intervention to ensure that uh, part one needs to be done and validated before part two goes? Is there an authorization method that when it gets to a certain point that a, let's say your, um, your management gets an email to say, yes, we're good to go and go, go uh, and deploy. Uh, is there an audit trail so that something happens and you can see, hey, who authorized this? Who uh, initiated this? And so on. So these are all things that in an ops environment, we really need to keep in mind. And for us, uh, we do have an evolving tool set to help you with that. First is PowerShell and CLI. And if we look at PowerShell uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we released uh, 7.2. And we've moved to a long-term uh, serviceable uh, model. So uh, 7.2 will be uh, serviced for three years. Uh, it is stable, built on .NET 6. And it's the beginning of changing PowerShell to make it a platform uh, where modules are going to get uh, more and more integrated, but also uh, just like code when you're uh, developing in Node or, or any other languages, where you can call those uh, modules as you need them, and you don't have to worry about is are, are all the modules installed on all the servers that I'm going to run this automation on. Anyway, so that's uh, PowerShell has been a, a uh, an, an improvement. Uh, Azure Automation. Azure Automation does a lot of things that is, they're basically the, the, the native tools to get things done. And I'm a big believer of not reinventing the wheel. So if there is a native tool to uh, in, allow you to get your automation done, such as uh, inventory, uh, uh, desired state configuration, uh, patch updates, all of these things, Azure Automation does that for you. And it also gives you uh, run books that you can write either in Bash or in PowerShell and run them automatically on triggers or on um, schedule. We have Logic Apps and Function. And Logic Apps and Function, uh, in a lot of cases, are considered dev tools. Uh, but they are wonderful in a way to run uh, your automation platform because uh, they're serverless. So you, there's no dependencies on you maintaining a server uh, infrastructure in order to support your uh, uh, automation uh, if efforts. Uh, they're fairly cheap and easy to work with. So if you've not looked at uh, Logic Apps and Function, I highly suggest that you do. Uh, and I didn't add it to the slide, but there's also Power Automate uh, that gives you a lot of uh, customization and automation uh, possibilities, uh, but mostly on the desktop and in uh, when dealing with other services like uh, uh, between, let's say, Teams and Office and Outlook and emails and triggers. Azure Arc enabled servers. We are living in an hybrid world. We have stuff on-prem, and believe me, stuff will remain on-prem for the foreseeable future. Uh, the last in-person Ignite, Jason Zander, which is the, uh, the corporate vice president that looks after Azure, stated that we no longer thought that uh, hybrid was a transition to cloud native. Hybrid is the end state or majority or a lot of our customers. So you guys, we don't expect everything to move to the cloud, but we want to assure that cloud services allow you to manage your information and your systems wherever they may be. So by using Azure Arc enabled servers, you can give those servers, whether they're running on-prem, whether they're running in AWS, GPC, GCP, uh, or any other cloud services. Sorry, I uh, had a little clip there. Don't laugh, April. Uh, I was just say those other clouds, we can just cover it with that. That's right, those other clouds, those other environments. 
but by enabling them with Azure Arc enabled servers, whatever you write in terms of monitoring, uh, automation, desired state configuration, everything else does apply to them. So you bring them into Azure by giving them an identity in Azure, you tie them in there, an Azure uh, agent gets deployed and then manages all of that for you. So very, very powerful uh, in a way to manage all of your environments, regardless where they may be. GitHub Actions is another one that uh, actually uh, April is going to walk you through that uh, as tremendous possibilities, regardless whether or not it's to support an application or a dev team or to support your line of business or your corporate uh, requirements. Bicep is a great one, and there and I saw that in the agenda. There's, there's multiple sessions on Bicep, and Bicep is just your infrastructure as code uh, on steroids. A JSON is not easy to write. It's not easy to read. Uh, it looks like spaghetti when you're looking at it. Um, Bicep is a great, great uh, improvement on writing JSON. So if you are uh, using infrastructure as code, or if you're involved in using uh, ARM template, I highly suggest that you look at those sessions uh, from Frank, uh, Alex Frankel, uh, and I think Satya Vell also have the really good uh, bicep sessions that are uh, in the agenda for this week. And of course, you have your traditional Windows AD management tool and the Windows admin servers that all of that put together gives you a really great foundation and a really uh, wide set of tools, and most of them uh, native, built to support that. Like I didn't even mention uh, Azure Auto Manage that enables predetermined uh, sessions for your environment. Anyway, that being said, I'm going to pass it to uh, April, who's going to take you through the DevOps side of that equation and uh, give you uh, a demo of uh, how she deals with it. How I deal with it. Well, thank you, Pierre. Um, everyone, awesome. Glad to have everyone here. It's great to watch the chat as Pierre was speaking. Um, no, I cannot pronounce Louisville properly because I'm not actually from there. Um, my father lives there, but I, I, I can't pronounce it. Um, I'm not a native. It just doesn't work. But the Derby is awesome. Um, so yeah, so we're talking about DevOps and we want to accelerate our delivery. We want to automate things. And Pierre spoke about DevOps in such a great way. And I want to give us a definition of DevOps. If I were to ask each and every one of you right now in the chat to tell me how do you define DevOps, I would get completely different answers. And this is probably a lot more fun to run in person, but this is where we're at in the world. Um, but at Microsoft, we define DevOps with a very specific definition that is from my colleague, Donovan Brown. We define DevOps as the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to end users. Now, I wanna focus on this word value because we talk about automation, we talk about DevOps. I don't care what it is you're trying to deliver in your day-to-day -day job, if you're a developer or operational person, we all need to be delivering value. DevOps allows us to bring people together through shared common goals and increase our collaboration together as teams and focus on improving continuously. We want to enable our teams to be able to collaborate more efficiently and enhance their productivity, and especially through automation. So before we go talking about automation, I'm going to use this phrase called shifting left. Some of you may have heard it, some of you may have not. Effectively, we want to do things early and often, and that's what DevOps really tries to promote. We want to learn to fail fast. So if we try to do something, we want to automate something. So Pierre asked the question, what's our return on investment on automating this thing? Well, we want to fail fast because if it doesn't work, we want to know quickly. So when we do things early and often, we call this shifting left. And this is part of everyone's role in, in DevOps. Um, doing things early, meaning involving that security team in play. We've all been there. If those of you that are IT pros deploying infrastructure, you've deployed something, security person goes, we've got a hole, you didn't do this properly. How can we automate it to make that better? If you're a developer going, oh, I wrote some code, it's great, but then they found a bug in production. We want to find those things earlier in the process and we want to plan out how we do things. So I want to give everyone this idea of an, an epic deployment. How many of you have been in this situation? And I know I have many times. We have a monolithic 
deployment uh, we have this big application and we know that maybe twice a year every six months we're going to update our application and our infrastructure all at once we tend to do this over a bank holiday weekend a long weekend maybe memorial day labor day weekends and it's really an all hands on deck situation and during these updates we're looking to do new features maybe some bug bug fixes large and small and look at some dependencies that might need to be fixed in our infrastructure now we know this is all hands on deck so we have our subject matter experts involved we're all on call and we know that all our services are going to go temporarily offline for some of these products now this epic deployment is really stressful um you have your subject matter experts there but as soon as they're done they're off they're like you know what i've done my 12 hours i'm done and we know there's issues there's going to be just on-demand engineering and we have to make just special specific tweaks every single time this is not a good deployment situation because if you ask a developer, you have a bug in your code and they wrote that code six months ago, they're not gonna know or really why they did that six months ago. When I'm writing code, I can't tell you what I did six, six months ago and I can't tell you why I did it. I just can't. I can barely remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, much less the code I wrote six months ago. So this, this epic deployment is a huge manual task. It's slow, it's unreproducible and it's complex. So we want to move away from that. So we're going to look at maybe some ways we could potentially think about doing that in organizations. Now, I want everyone to think about the people side of DevOps, because remember, we talked about these three pillars, the people, process, and the products. Now, the people side is the hardest side of DevOps, because you're asking people to have a cultural shift within your organization. Now, this cultural shift needs to take place, and everyone needs to buy into it. And as the operational team, you're more than likely the leaders in your IT organization. Everyone in this organization needs to come together to continuously deliver value for this to work effectively. Now, let's think of it this way, okay? I'm an IT pro, I manage an infrastructure. I am incentivized to keep this on 24 by seven by 365. I need to keep all the lights on. My developer over here, who's the other side of April maybe, um, is there to deliver new features. Now, those two people, those two groups of people are incentivized very, very differently their values are not aligned. So we need to think about how we wanna create value together as a team and we need our teams to be delivering that same value. So it doesn't matter what we wanna automate, what we wanna change, we all need to be in that same team. At Microsoft, we actually made a change in our engineering teams to really make that happen and that's a topic we can kind of discuss for a whole other day. But then we have the process side of DevOps and we like to think of this into four phases. We have the planning phase where we start shifting left right we do things early and often we plan out what we're going to deploy when we're going to deploy it we do things in sprint cycles and i know that's a very developer term but as an it pro think of it as having a goal you want to reach and a plan for a set amount of time we're going to go into that development phase which is the next phase of that now we say development and and i'm going to say this is probably a faux pas on microsoft side we always say developer this developer that and as an it pro you're going but i'm not a developer okay, maybe not in your day-to-day -day job, but you're writing code, you're automating something, that's okay. You can call yourself whatever you want. And that's tough, but that's where we write this code is that development phase. And then we deliver this code and it goes into production. When it goes into production, we need to operate this code. We need to know what it's doing um, pretty much at all times. And then the operational side, we can get this monitoring and know what's happening after the fact. So when we go into that next planning phase, we know exactly what went well and what didn't go well. So when we talk about automation, we should think of tooling over tasks. We want to let our machines do the repetitive tasks while our humans are building the tools to solve the actual problems. So here we have automation to the rescue. Let's think about our modern deployment practices. Now, as an IT pro, you're going, well, I don't want to write myself out of a job. And, you know, as Pierre said, I'm a big, you know, he, he pointed out the Jeffrey Snover thing. Automation is career security. In most cases, yes. So when we look at these modern deployment practices, we wanna do things where we can improve our system reliability because we want to deliver that value to our end users, whether that's keeping the systems online, hearts, heartbeats going, getting our features into production and less bugs. We wanna look at continuous delivery. So we're continuously delivering something, not like that big epic deployment where we're just throwing stuff out every six months and it's this massive beast we want to deliver often. We want to start putting tests into our code. So if we're writing a PowerShell script and going, I want to automate this thing over here, let's test it before we just deploy it. Let's put in unit testing into our day-to-day -day code, whether you're a .NET developer or you're writing in Golang or Rust, whatever. We need to have test automation before it goes to that production environment. 
And we start talking about modern deployment strategies and we wanna take, take advantage of CICD, which we call continuous integration, continuous delivery. So we have continuous integration, we're packaging our code and we're running tests against it. Our continuous delivery means we're delivering it somewhere and it doesn't always have to be to production. So when we deliver this stuff, we will get what we measure. And Pierre spoke about it. You get those audit logs that are like thousand pages long. You log into work on a Monday morning. I know I did today. And you have like all these things and you're like, I've had all these alerts. What's beneficial, what's not? So we really need to make sure that whatever it is we're measuring in that monitoring bit of our environments that we have traceability. We need environment traceability to know what's going on in our application stack and in our uh, IT infrastructure stack. So this is where auditing and compliance is really important. When I work with organizations, they're like, well, we have auditing requirements, compliance requirements. Absolutely. DevOps plays into that and helps benefit you, especially that automation side, because you can have full end-to-end -end traceability. We can correlate our production deployments to specific build instances. We can trace back to a pull request and a code change. And then our byproduct of this is using things like pipelines or GitHub Actions, et cetera, some kind of controlled deployment mechanism. So this is great in a post incident review as well, as well as compliance auditing. We're going to have an outage at Microsoft. We have them all the time. We're quite transparent when we're about, when we have them. For any of you that work in Azure, we do quite often tell you when there's an outage, when we recognize it. For any of you that play Xbox, we have Xbox uh, Live and we have a website that tells you when things go wrong. So when we set up this monitoring and this measurement, we have observability that sets our systems up for analysis, gaining insights into why things happen, because we are going to have an outage. And that's the unfortunate thing, but also tells us the health of our systems. We can look at distributed tracing and infrastructure monitoring. We can provide topology mapping. We can provide a lot more information back to the business. So let's talk about an end to end automated solution. We talked about DevOps being, you know, the people side, the process side, and the tooling side, and there's a lot going on, right? So let's think of in the four phases. Let's start with your engineer. And I'm gonna use the phrase engineer because Microsoft did that with us. They, they started calling us engineers because it didn't matter what specialty we worked in, we were an engineer because we became kind of very cross-functional teams. So in this cross-functional team, we did planning and we used tools like Azure boards and you can use GitHub projects or maybe another third-party tool, whatever works for you and your organization. We then develop our code and we might be using something like Visual Studio. I prefer Visual Studio code, but each and every individual and organization has the technology they prefer. Or maybe they're using GitHub code spaces. Then we're delivering our code. Our code sits in an Azure repository. So when I'm automating something, even if it's a simple script, I don't keep it on my machine. I put it into a repository so I can share it. And also, Pierre kind of talked about that hit by a bus analogy. And someone in the, in the group mentioned, you know, winning the lottery. If I won the lottery, I'd still go to work. I love what I do and I'm probably not ready to give it up yet. But if still that point in case where you lose that single point of failure in your organization or you just go to maybe on a vacation, you need to be able to take that time off and walk away from your job knowing someone else can pick it up or it's automated in a pipeline. So in this picture here, in this diagram, we're automating our infrastructure using, again, whatever tool you want. We're using Azure repos as the example through Azure DevOps pipelines, the tooling, and we're deploying to virtual machines in Azure. And then we're wrapping that up for a monitoring for operational phase with application in, uh, excuse me, Azure application insights. And we can use things like Azure monitor or again, other third party tools. So Pierre talked a little bit about GitHub actions and I wanna go a little bit further into the GitHub space. You guys probably all know that Microsoft acquired GitHub. Now that's absolutely fine. Why do we do that? Because over 50 million developers utilize GitHub day in and day out. So we talk about using tooling to our advantage. Now tooling is not gonna make us DevOps experts and a lot of us have probably invested in tooling and it's not gotten us to where we hoped we had been. Uh, but I wanna point out some of the features built into GitHub that help us benefit when we are looking to automate. Why? Because the tooling can help, we can leverage to help us get there. So GitHub has security built in. So from day one, when you check in your code to a code repository, um, we have features like code QL where your code is treated as data. So it scans your code as it's pushed up into your repository. Then we have Dependabot, which is dependency scanning. And if it finds a dependency in your public repo, it opens up a PR for you and gives you some suggested fixes and remediation because as humans, we cause faults. One of my other favorite features in GitHub um, repositories, and this is also in Azure repos, is secret scanning. How many of you have built a server, built a thing, deployed some code, and you have a secret, maybe a connection stream somewhere or a password, you put it into a text file and hide it. I've done it. 
because I kind of had to, I was short on time. I didn't know where to put something or I didn't have the tools at that time to help me leverage. We know that 80% of cloud breaches take place because someone's left a secret in a plain text file somewhere out in the open that people can find. So when we're using things like GitHub repositories, where it's a private or public repository, we have secret scanning. So it scans that repository and notifies the administrator as soon as it's found. So that inherent technology in there can help us leverage security in what we're doing. And I want to talk about GitHub Actions. Um, we have GitHub Actions, which are not just CICD. So they're not just used for GitHub, excuse me, for continuous integration and continuous delivery. You can literally do use them to automate anything you want from a GitHub repository. They are meant to respond to GitHub events. So yes, they can do CICD and you're testing all this cool stuff. They use Linux, Windows, and Mac OS cloud host runners. So you can test against any kind of operating system that your code may need to run against. They're event and schedule driven. So you could do it maybe on a schedule that every day at certain times of day, or maybe someone checks into your repo or does something with your repository and action can be triggered. They're really easy to write. They're easy to share and they're modular and they're reusable. And that's what's really key in automation is the reu reusability piece. So when we talk to organizations about how do I get started using DevOps, there's a lot of places you can go with it, but I want to go ahead and show you guys a full end to end solution that we've leveraged in Azure. So I'm going to deploy an Azure static web app. Why an Azure static web app? Because I don't want to deploy a website to just a virtual machine. I actually want to deploy it to an Azure static web app because it's a platform as a service as an IT operations professional. I don't want to maintain the operating system, the firewall and everything else that goes to that security footprint. I want to get my developers to deploy the website. And maybe it's a scenario where we're hosting a large event like this one and we need to get a website up and maybe we don't have the infrastructure available. We don't have the space in our SAN, et cetera. So I'm going to leverage something like an Azure static web app. So I'm going to go ahead and deploy this Azure static web app from PowerShell. And what I'm doing is I'm giving it the name. I'm telling it the resource group in Azure. And I'm giving it the code repository where my code sits so that my developer's code can be hosted. I actually don't need to access it. I have hidden the PAT token. And if I go into my Azure repo, refresh my page, I can see that within a couple of seconds, I have a new Azure static web app created. Now, when we create this Azure static web app, it gives us a URL. I can get a custom DNS name on the front of it. it you don't have to use the one that's generically provided, but I'm just gonna go ahead and use this one now. So if I go ahead and click on that URL, we can see that it's spun up a service. My static web app is actually live, but it's waiting for our code. Our code hasn't gone into it yet. It's just spun up that Azure resource really quickly. We can also see that it's pointing to my source control. It can see that I'm using my main branch in GitHub. We're gonna go over the deployment history in a minute and it gives us a workflow. So what this means is as soon as I create the Azure static web app by default, it's giving me a GitHub action workflow out of the box. So this is really cool. I didn't write this, it does it for me. So when you look at how do I get started with automation, how do I do something end to end, Azure Static Web Apps have this built in out of the box. And this is something you're gonna see more readily from the products in Azure, the capability to deploy things with CICD and your repositories. So these help encourage developer best practices. So in this action, it's going to trigger on any kind of push to my main branch or pull request. And what's going to do, it's going to build and deploy my code. And what it's done here is it's actually taken the tokens for my repository and my API token and already created a secret for it. So it's not on display. It's already secured that code for me. I'm going to go back to my static web app and I can actually see the deployment history. Now, this will take me to the job that's running now with this Azure static web app. Oh, and I've lost everything. Apologies. The beauty of this uh, of uh, doing the webcast, right? Yeah, let me get right. that back. If I can. All right, I'm going to talk through it. It's going to run. And I apologize, everyone. This is where doing things not live is amazing, as in not in front of you all. Um, so effectively, I've deployed this Azure Static Web App. It's given me a GitHub action that I can run from. So I'm going to let this run through. And what it's doing is giving me that CICD capability. The other thing it's doing, it allows me to make code changes and have full traceability end to end. Um, so this is going to run through and it's going to go, go to the URL, give me the workflow. I'm actually going to stop it because I'm going to tell you about the service. So it gave me an action. It gave me full ICD, CICD capability. The other thing it does is 
that I was going to show you all is I can go and make a live change to my code. And when I make that live change, I create a pull request. And from that pull request, it's going to run through that action again. It's going to it can run any of my tests that I insert in there, etc. The other cool thing about a st Azure static web app in GitHub Actions, that's absolutely unique to GitHub and Azure is that when I then go make code changes, it's going to open up not only that pull request, but give me a staging site. That staging site is going to be very similar to my production site, but not touching my production environment. So what it's doing is protecting production because we, when we work with CI CD, we need to absolutely protect production. So, it gives me a new site, I can test it and close my PR. The other thing it does is it gives me full traceability end to end. So I apologize that this didn't go through in the right timing, but I want to just touch on this last key point. When we talk about objectives and key results, we want to deliver value from across our teams. And we want these teams to be aligned in what we call OKRs, okay? We want to measure our outcomes, not our outputs. We want to remove any unhelpful KPIs that our teams are delivering it. So these teams aren't bashing their heads against what they're trying to deliver together. We want to deliver quality over quantity. So we need clear mission statements. We need to see how we're going to accomplish this and we need all work together to deliver that value. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Apology, the demo crashed, but that is the life of working in tech. If any of you want to reach out further with questions, please do reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and I can actually get the whole explanation of Azure Static Web Apps and the beauty of them and the built-in CI CD capability. Well, thank you, uh, April. Uh, we've talked about automation, we've talked about DevOps, we've talked about both. One of the things that we need to make sure is that we do these things wrapped in the security audit and compliance uh, environment, uh, especially in a corporate environment. And what that means is that we all live right there in the intersection. So people doing DevOps also do automation and some people doing automation also do uh, the DevOps practices and we do it in a secure fashion. I hope this was uh, interesting for you. Uh, we kind of run through it a little bit uh, faster than uh, we would have loved to, but there are a number of resources. And as April uh, mentioned, you guys can reach us. Uh, I am and always shall be at Wired Canuck. And April is, of course, the April Edwards. So thank you very much. And I hope you have a wonderful conference.